years, and tombstones quake from countless fears. Whenever candlelights flicker and often go out, that is the time when ghosts are about. Creepies and crawlies from last Halloween awaken the spirits for Midsummer Scream. Swinging wake now summon you all your seats to take. Our time is short, so let us begin. Yale, Claude, Mark, Walt, and all others, we invoke you. Come in. creak in doorless chambers, and strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls. Whenever candlelights flicker where the air is deathly still, that is the time when ghosts are present, practicing their terror with ghoulish delight. Do -do -do. anticipated attraction in Disneyland's history opened to a curious public. The Haunted Mansion became an instant favorite and for the last five decades has remained one of the world's most beloved theme park staples. Not only does the Haunted Mansion stand out as a monument to the genius of those wet Imagineers that breed life and death into its gloomy halls. It has inspired new generations of attraction designers, filmmakers, haunters, and fans who hold the mansion in the utmost regard. Today, we celebrate the Haunted Mansion and its 50-year chilling legacy. Please welcome to the stage, Imagineer legend and creator of the Haunted Mansion's Doom Buggies, 
Bob Gurr. Producer of Disney's Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, and The Haunted Mansion, Don Hahn. Imagineering legend, Tony Baxter. Former creative executive of Walt Disney Imagineering, Tom Morris. Interior designer of the Haunted Mansion, Tanya Norris. And your host for this presentation, Doug Barnes of the Season Pass Podcast. You guys all in line for the Haunted Mansion right now? Oh my gosh, this is a lot of people. All right, you guys, uh, thank you so much for being here at Midsummer Scream. How many are you excited about this weekend? Right? The best weekend in Halloween is right now. All right, so we are going to celebrate this little ride that's celebrating 50 years right down the street, known as the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland. You know, I've always looked at this as never just a ride, but this is actually a life experience and it's something that sticks with you forever, right? So a part of your life really does, you know, Haunted Mansion is part of it throughout your life. So everything that you look at in theme parks and just themed entertainment in general, you usually end up judging it by the Haunted Mansion. So, um, so very happy to be here with you guys. Uh, this, is, this, is a, uh, this is a nice panel that we got stacked up right here, right? All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Of course, uh, 50 years, Haunted Mansion, Disneyland. And uh, uh, this is me with my sister, Rebecca. So this is, uh, this is when uh, I was innocent and easygoing and stuff, three years old, 1982. And then uh, after that, 25 years of complete confusion happened in my life. So uh, I, uh, my first visit to Disneyland, went there, and uh, I remember two things after that visit. I remembered a head in a ball talking to me, made me scoot down in my seat. And then I remembered a giant eyeball staring at me and I slid further into my seat. So as I remember coming back home after that trip and I was like, okay, I don't know if I need to do Disneyland ever again. But I decided that, uh, yeah, uh, you know, at some point I'm gonna grow up, right? So five years later, 1987, the parents are like, we're going back to Disneyland. You know, I'm eight years old, I'm much stronger, I'm a bigger guy, I'm into, uh, you know, facing my fears. So I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test that Haunted Mansion. We're also here for that, this little ride that opened up called Star Tours. Tony, have you heard of Star Tours? Did you? Oh, okay. All right, Star Tours. Star Tours was awesome, by the way. And then uh, we got an eyeball for you. you know? <laughs> well, that's, you're jumping ahead of the story, Tony. <laughs> no, but um, so we had the chance to uh, go on Haunted Mansion, and I went through it, went through the, the rooms, the hallways, the doors, saw the head, Madame Leota, uh, passed her. I was like, yeah, I did it. I went past that. I went into the ballroom, saw them dancing, went into the attic, we went into the graveyard, and then we saw ourselves in mirrors and we were done. And I was thinking, that was awesome. I'm, you know, I'm so happy I got to do this again and not be so scared of it. Where's that eyeball? Where, where's that eyeball at? And uh, so I asked my parents, I asked mom, I'm like, hey, mom, do you remember there was an eyeball that was staring at me? And she said, no. <laughs> like, no, there was. I know there was. She goes, son, you were three years old. I'm like, oh, no, I know there was an eyeball. So I went to my dad. I said, dad, there's an eyeball that was staring at us. And he's like, okay, son. So <laughs> they, they thought I was insane. You know, so I, I, you know, I went on in life. Uh, for the next 20 years of my life, until 2007, when I was at work, we, I work at a data entry place. It's just a bunch of cubicles. We have headphones to listen to music and podcasts. And I was really getting into podcasts at that time. I was listening to a podcast called uh, Window to the Magic. And they were, there you go. We got three Paul fans over here. That's awesome. 
All <laughs> right. So, uh, and they play the audio to this uh, ride called Adventure Through Inner Space. There you go. Well, I guess, yeah. So my confusion of thinking that I was insane and fabricating things in my mind for 25 years all came to a halt right at the moment when I turned, the, when they started playing the audio and I heard magnification and I started hearing the music and all of a sudden I like jetted back to a three-year-old sitting in the middle of an Omnimover vehicle and then I realized I never made it up that was really there and the whole point of this story is to say that Wagner was the beginning of my insanity from a three-year-old <laughs> to right now. My parents still don't remember that at all. They're, I called them up, I'm like, do you remember that? And they're like, no. But Bob, so let's go ahead and start about the Doom Buggies a little bit. Uh, did this vehicle actually start with Monsanto's Adventure 3 Inner Space, or did it start with uh, the Haunted Mansion? Everybody thinks the uh, Omnimover, the Doom Buggy, started with the Haunted Mansion. How many of you know it never started in the Haunted Mansion? That was stolen from the um, Voyage to Inner Space, which was two years earlier. But the, uh, the big difference was we found out with the uh, Voyage to Inner Space, I have a kind of a car that you could snuggle two or three people in, and it was our first time that operations found out a whole new side of guest behavior. <laughs> Yes, I'm not going to go in too far into that one. But, uh, I, I worked that ride for but, one uh, summer. <laughs> that explains so much. Yeah. No, that, that, that's all right. I was hired to do fun vehicles, and boy, that was the funnest vehicle. <laughs> so, what did you want to know seriously about the Doom Buggies? <laughs> Well, I was wondering, you know, since you were there when they needed it, what, what was the conversation that said, let's get this, the, the Omnimover and the Beat the Doom buggy for the uh, Omnimover? Okay, if uh, some of you remember the uh, New York World's Fair 1964-65, there was uh, two other attractions that had a continuous line of vehicles. That appealed to me from, from a good standpoint. If you have a chain of vehicles, you can't have a collision, so you don't need an anti-collision system. Okay, we got that one done. If the vehicles are following one another fairly closely, you're going to have a pretty good uh, theoretical ride capacity. Well, these uh, two vehicles that I'm talking about, one rode sideways and one uh, followed the vehicle in front. So all you saw was the back of the hair of the people in front. Well, that's not fun. So I was sitting talking to John Hench, and he happened to have a candied apple sitting on his desk, and I just have some wine and picked it up and twirled it. I says, John, we could make a chain of vehicles that runs on a track, but instead of putting the body on the vehicle rigidly, I could put it where I could turn it and I could uh, lean forward and lean back, and this would give the art directors and the storytellers a chance to direct the audience into each scene. And it would also save some time. As you turn from one scene to the other, you can turn uh, quickly and uh, have less time loss in the segue between scenes. And that, it was such a simple thing, and I said, John, we're going to move a bunch of people, and we'd just move them in all different directions, and I was a pilot at the time, and there was a, um, a thing called navigational aid called Omni Range. I said, John, this is be at the Omnimover. So you got to watch out what you call your first sketch, because the name got stuck, and we never got a chance to give it a proper name, so I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but that's how it developed. Uh, the writers uh, on, uh, if you remember, the Haunted Mansion was going to be a, a really crump, scary walkthrough, and you can't control people when you, when you go from a sequence of one thing to another. And as they saw us developing the, uh, uh, the Omnibur at 1401 Flower in the back, we had a little test track. They said, oh my gosh, that solves our walk-around problem. So bang, the Haunted Mansion would have been sitting there kind of dormant for years figuring out how to do it. They said, we got it. We got the answer. So the Haunted Mansion changed and went a whole new direction of the idea that you have directed scenes, you have all the gags that you want to do, and since the track had already been uh, going to prove itself out very well, the Doom Buggies came to life. There you go. And that's what it's known for. That's what we know is what we for. I mean, many of us from, remember it from Adventure Through Inner Space, but it's legend with... Well, you, you ask a technical question, I'll give you the technical answer, yes. Yeah, right. that's true. Right on. So we are going to actually go on to Tony Baxter right over here. And uh, Tony, so obviously, uh, the Hunter Mansion meant 
quite a bit to you in your younger years, uh, growing up at Disneyland. Oh yeah, because for about eight of those younger years, it was not open. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd ride the train and you'd look down through the slats and the, the thing to see if there was any construction work down below the train. And uh, so finally when it went into production, of course I couldn't resist being a riot operator out there and I snuck in. So here's a secret. One of those doors in the corridor of doors, if you look closely, it's got an exit sign on it. That goes outside into the rear of Disneyland. It also is an entry for an employee that's taking his break and going over to sneak into the haunted mansion. <laughs> I remember walking in that door and then walking down to the Madame Leota seance. And I just sat there mesmerized until a security guard came by and took me, hauled me back to uh, the other side of the park. <clears throat> anyway, uh, this is kind of interesting, the shot here, because uh, Steve Davidson had uh, come up with the idea of putting a, uh, a Christmas overlay on. And he brought me, I was the head of the park design group there, and, and he brought me in to show it to me. It was, an, it was just the night before Christmas in the Haunted Mansion. And of course, we had this brand new property, but it was a touchstone film, if you remember when it came out. So it wasn't exactly uh, approved for Disneyland. But we were able to uh, add that one word in there, and kind of the rest was history on making the duality of the shows we have at Disneyland and in Tokyo. And so that's, you know, the, and the other thing would be the, the, the half box ghost, if you want me to go on. Yeah, keep on uh, going. He was in there for the first week that I wrote it. And I actually had a little card that I found that uh, has proof. If you look on there, you can see number 28, ghost hat box. So it was actually maintained for a while, and about a week. And we, I think a little video showed up of it. But anyway, I thought I was the monomaniac about getting it back into the house. But it turned out Guillermo del Toro is obsessed with that character. So uh, at, one, at one of the... At Comic Cons, he announced, I'm going to do this Haunted Mansion movie again, a, a, a sequel, and I'm going to have it starring the Hatbox Ghost so we can finally get that at Del in the ride if it's the star of my book. And in the years that came on, he actually had one built for his collection, and uh, some friends of mine were able to do that for him, and he did an incredible storyboard and whatnot. And then it fell by the wayside. But we at the park decided, you know, enough time has passed and let's get that guy in there. So uh, the hat box goes to, and I, I really think John Gritz did an incredible job of, you know, staging that and everything, and it works really, really well. So that was uh, that aspect. And I don't know if you want to go on to Phantom Manor yet. Oh, there's, there's plenty to talk about. Yeah, we'll bring up Phantom Manor. I just remembered that there was a few year ago, years ago, I remember you let me hold that card. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my hands started shaking. And I was like, because I got, I was starting to sweat, and I was scared that I was going to destroy the card by just sweating on this thing from my holding the moment this legendary card. So I had to give it back to you really quick. I was you like, know, hey. for me it was the opposite. I was like, I'm not lying. I really did see it there. You know? <laughs> and so I was so thrilled when a really bad eight-millimeter movie showed up where somebody actually captured this guy in there. So yeah. It did, it did well, Obviously, you have been inspired. You've done a few attractions since then that are inspired by the haunted engine. Oh, yeah. Engine. Yeah. It was interesting when we went to Paris. Uh, we did a lot of research about the Europeans and the French in general, in specific. And it turned out that they got funny. They loved Jerry Lewis. And they, <laughs> yeah, he's a, a, a national hero over there. But of course. They also love scary. I mean, the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery, for those of you that love Gothic cemeteries, a must. You must go there before you die. Or go there after you die. That was <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'll be there. It was fan, the inspiration for Fan of the Opera. Anyway, but they don't get scary funny. And that was the weird thing because Mark favored the very comical things. And Claude Coates, who had ordered a screening of the movie The Haunting by Robert Wise, if you haven't seen it, it's the 1961, not the newer one from DreamWorks, but uh, they watched that over and over again. And you can clearly see the doors in the haunted hallway. Um, pulsing and everything, that's from that movie, as is the wallpaper patterns that come to life. Uh, so there was a, a schism between Mark and Claude, Claude preferring the more frightening and, and Mark liking the humor. And so when we did Paris, we had the decision to make, are we going to go humorous and keep it pure to that or go scary? And I think we came down a little bit more scary on it and they just redid it. I'm going to pitch something here. This great book just came out three days ago just on Phantom Manor, and the redo of the ride is extraordinary, uh, and they've even strengthened the story. 
It's real macabre. You watch the bride go from a young, beautiful thing to an aging corpse at the end of the ride. Um, and so, yeah. I, three of these are on order. I was hoping I could hold it up for you today, but I uh, just didn't get here in time. But yeah, so it's just been redone. If you haven't seen it in the last year, you haven't seen it. All right. Congratulations on that, by the way, too. That's awesome. You know, talking about it, you said that Haunted Mansion obviously was inspiration. Uh, Don, uh, Haunted Mansion's been inspiration for you, too. It's a big piece of your life as well, right? Yeah, I, like Tony, I was uh, one of the kids outside the gates of Haunted Mansion for years waiting for something to happen inside. And I was also uh, one of the teenagers uh, inside the, the dune buggies making out with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I was much younger then. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was hollowed ground. I mean, what you said is really right. And, and I, when you're especially um, younger and you see that for the first time, it's, it's amazing. And in the early 2000s, uh, Disney had looked at its uh, IP and the, the kind of properties it owned, and they said, well, we can actually make movies from some of the properties we own. So the first two that they greenlit were uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion. And so uh, Rob Minkoff, who I'd done The Lion King with, and I had worked together, and I love Rob, uh, and he's going to be here later tonight, actually, for a screening of Haunted Mansion. And we started working on it, and um, I, we we're both from animation. I had come out of, uh, had finished uh, Beauty and the Beast and Emperor's New Groove and some of those films, and he had done Stuart Little, and we, we started by going over to Imagineering and going through the library and talking to anybody that we could talk to who had worked on it and looking at the, the, the uh, kind of mythology behind it, the storytelling behind it. And then the coolest thing that I possibly have ever done in my life at Disney is we went to the park at about six o'clock one morning and turned the lights on in the attraction and walked through it. And it was amazing and kind of <clears throat> humbling because it is, you know, for me anyway, it was kind of a humble setting. It's, you look behind the scenes and it's plywood and it's blacklight paint and it's things that, you know, to the eye might look, um, very common, but then you turn the lights off and it's the coolest thing ever. So like the stage right behind us. It was just an amazing kind of a theater of it all. Um, so we hired a great production designer, John Meyer, who actually recently just did the production design on um, Mary Poppins Returns. Huge fan of Disney and um, we built the whole mansion. We thought we can't really do this in an existing mansion, so we built it in sound stages. So everything on the screen in that film is on sound stages, except for the exterior which we built on a ranch out in uh, Santa Clarita. So if you live out in the Santa Clarita Valley, uh, the Haunted Mansion lives out there too, or lived out there. So uh, then we spent three months with Eddie Murphy, which is a topic for a whole other discussion, <laughs> and, uh, and had a good time making the movie. There you go. So obviously it's such an important piece of Disney's history because they wanted to make a movie out of that, like they did with Pirates of the Caribbean. One was absolutely amazing. And then, yeah, you had the great job on Haunted Mansion. That <laughs> you guys make sure if you're at the gala tonight to, to be there uh, tonight because I uh, it should be a ton it's of fun. There's so much to talk about. Um, yeah, it was intimidating too because uh, Pirates of the Caribbean with Johnny Depp came out right before Haunted Mansion, and Eddie Murphy's last movie was Pluto Nash, which was a great movie. Um, but it, well, really, you should see it. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we did the best we could, and everybody strives incredibly hard to make these movies, and uh, we had people like the Rick Baker, who's an amazing, amazing actor. Um, so part of the fun for me was just hanging out with people like Rick and, uh, and, and you know, our composer and some of our special effects guys, just to be able to kind of find out how they approach their stage craft to turn it into this film. So it was a great experience in the end. Awesome. I just want to say those sets were incredible, and I'm glad to hear Mary Poppins is by the same guy. But we were going to bring the conservatory to Disneyland, because I always felt when you step into the dune buggies, you're kind of in a nowhere land. And we had that all mapped out. It fit perfectly. But then the movie came out. Uh, yeah. You know, hope springs eternal. You try to make good movies, and sometimes they win, and sometimes they win less. The other one, uh, there's so much I could say. The, other one, um, the, uh, the stairway, though, in Gracie Mansion, the like, end stairway, we have ended up shipping to the uh, Disney MGM Studio Tour at the time down in Florida. It was an attraction on one of the sound stages down there, because I just couldn't stand throwing that set in the dumpster. And that's what was going to happen. So we just like called everybody I knew, and we ended up shipping a portion of that down to Walt Disney World. Awesome, awesome. Right on. Well, uh, Tom, 
I mean, you've been inspired quite a bit by this attraction too, and you you really went deep in studying this thing too as well. Right. Uh, oh yeah, there's a shot right there. This is from the uh, Big Green Collection, who uh, he was one of the architects uh, in the later uh, part of the history of the Haunted Mansion. Uh, Bill Martin. Um, actually, a lot of people were involved, um, as you all know. And I was one of those kids, just to back up a little bit, also, you know, drooling on the gates of the Haunted Mansion uh, back in the 60s and wondering when they could go. For anybody who doesn't know, well, why, why is everybody standing at the gates drooling at it? Why, <laughs> why couldn't they go in? Y you know, it was, uh, there were rumors already, you know, I, I think by like 65, 66, there were rumors that, you know, started to get out there and they were persistent. You know, it was, there was, it was way before the internet, of course before social media, but the, the rumors, I think a lot of it, at least, I, I grew up in Orange County, and there were Disney executives who, you know, lived around the neighborhood and whatever, and I think that might have had something to do, you know, with kids overhearing things at the dinner table and then exaggerating or whatever. Uh, but I think that was part of the whole mystique, you know, is, is, is it really gonna open or not? But being a sneaky kid, <laughs> if you rode the train, see that, uh, a girder area there, the black area below it was open between the railroad tracks and you knew as long as there was nothing in that space, the ride hadn't been right. built yet. Uh, <laughs> so uh, fast forward to uh, the end of the 70s and I actually get a job um, at Walt Disney Imagineering and I'm too busy really to be you know, a detective or anything and plus at the time it wasn't really cool to be you know, too interested in Disney and you know, to be a foamer uh, and be working there at the same time. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I kind of, you know, just every now and then, if I had the opportunity uh, to dig around, I'd dig around and, um, and, you know, just kind of take notes and things or whatever. But after 35 years of being there, I had a folder of really cool information and stuff. Um, so I am now retired and I am going to do a book um, uh, eventually on the archaeology of Disneyland. And uh, my whole thing is about uncovering new information, not retelling the same stories over and over again that you've heard, but finding new people who are involved, uh, new information, new stories, new anecdotes, and, and why, you know, obviously no one ever got hurt in there during those years, but that was part of the rumor mongering was that it was so scary that, you know, someone had a heart attack or fell in a snake pit. There were so many rumors. <laughs> those were two. Um, but why did that rumor? Persist. I always thought that was really interesting that it was so um, strong and so persistent and even showed up a little bit in newspapers from time to time and I can swear even hearing something on TV about it one time on the news and you know but obviously there was never anything in there um, built significantly but things did happen in there you know there was there were workers that went in there from time to time and the elevators were in there the whole time and that was one of the reasons why they would have to go in there uh, they'd have to fine-tune the elevators, uh, they would have to test them. Uh, there was actually an issue with them that they uncovered early, thankfully, uh, that required some rework. So, you know, if you were backstage, uh, you might see people coming in and out of that cavern that you just saw in there. And then in later years, it was actually a parade um, break area for the parade. It's where the parade went, uh, Fantasy on Parade would, I can't remember what the route was, but in it went through Frontierland and then it would park in that big, it was basically a big garage for the parade. And so, you know, who knows what <laughs> strange things might have, you know, occurred in there that might have started rumors. Anyway, this is a shot that, uh, well, if you see my presentation tomorrow, you'll find out a little bit more about this shot. It's interesting. Um, this is the graveyard, it's re referred to as the South Graveyard, and this was originally going to be one of the exits to the attraction and each exit was going to have three exits within that exit because you were supposed to find your way out. So that's where that line came from. And this gentleman here is Dave Jacobs, who you may remember. And he's standing in front of one of the openings um, that's just uh, right now in that picture. I think it's, just, it's either a board uh, that's painted black, but they had three of these little holes, little uh, hamster holes. <laughs> coming up out of the Haunted Mansion and you were going to exit. You're going to have to find your way out in some sort of maze-like thing before that and then eventually you come out in this um, graveyard.
then there'd be more fun little things in the graveyard. And the same goes for the other side. On the north side, that was also going to be an exit. This is when it was going to be a walkthrough, obviously. And this is a photo when they started building. Okay, so no one will believe this. I didn't believe it. I had one of those things where your memory is playing tricks with you, Tom. I left Disneyland. I went on a trip one time. I was really little. Um, and we, as we were leaving Disneyland, this is 1969, April 69, because it was you know, a birthday that we went to for a friend of mine. And we are leaving the park through the exit, and I see this building finally going up behind the chain link fence, which would be right where the Haunted Mansion would be. And it was still a skeleton of a building. And I'm like, oh, they're finally maybe going to do the Haunted Mansion. Uh, then years later, I went, April 69, you are, you know, what are you smoking? There's only a couple more months left. Well, it was April. This picture was taken in either late March or early April. And uh, they, they just worked fast back then. <laughs> uh, and they built two of them at the same time because all right. the material, all the animation, everything was at WDI when I came there in 70 and had been cycling to make sure it would last for Walt Disney World. Right. Now this is the North Cemetery, the North Graveyard. It's already been filled up uh, with dirt, so it actually goes down much lower, and you see two of the, um, they're referred to on the structural drawings as leave outs, which means don't pour concrete here, leave a hole. And um, so there were three of those leave outs. On that side, the one that you see in the lower right-hand corner was eventually used to put the moving speed ramp up through, and so you exit through that uh, little hole right there. But uh, it very much was intended to be a walkthrough. It was going to be two separate walkthroughs. Um, I've kind of seen chatter on some of the websites, you know, that kind of hypothesize whether or not, and people debate, you know, whether that uh, is true or not. But I can tell you definitely it was going to be two separate uh, walkthroughs. Uh, each elevator would be dedicated to one walkthrough, and then each of those walkthroughs would exit in their respective graveyard. And they did a few drawings of that, uh, including Carol Clark, the famous art director, uh, who was the art director for Mary Poppins, um, uh, was asked by Walt to work on this and lay out some of the rooms uh, for this walkthrough version. And uh, Yale Gracie was already buying, or he was specifying props for it. It really was going to open in 1964 or 65. They wanted it to open uh, in 63. They were planning for it to open in 63. Yale Gracie was purchasing props. They were buying the glass for it in 1963, or at least big giant um, sample pieces of the glass. And, and Yale had his list. Carol Clark and Marvin Davis had done um, layouts for it. And even Mapo started engineering some of the machinery that eventually ended up in the show. Now, whether they built the machinery, I would love to find out, and whether that informed what would eventually go inside of the attraction. So that's something I'm kind of in the middle of right now. Um, so I've kind of snuck these four, even though they're from Vic Green's collection. Uh, there are many, many more, and um, I hope someday to uh, get this um, into a book about not just the Haunted Mansion, but about the archaeology of Disneyland in general. It's going to have to wait because I'm doing another book before it that is a little bit more urgent um, that will tra trace the original Imagineers, track down missing Imagineers who we've never heard of before. Yes. Um, there's not just one sitting here next to me. Uh, there are many, many more that you've never heard of and, and that did amazing things. Yeah, absolutely. And you said again, you, so you're doing the archaeology of Haunted Mansion presentation tomorrow at 4? Tomorrow at 4. Uh, Which stage? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. One, one of the stages. <laughs> I'm sorry, your, I didn't. Your, your, yeah. your map, your map there. One of the stages at 4 o'clock. So um, I'll, I'll dive into this a little bit more, um, into the history. I, my focus on it is from the time they, they uh, decided to do this house in this location, not the not the Ken Anderson version of it, which uh, another great panel will be at the D23 on the Ken Anderson version from 1957 to, um, well, it was mostly 1957, it might have lingered on until 59. Uh, my focus is on this version um, with the New Orleans Square and all of that, and uh, it take, you know, there's some interesting little surprises and twists and, and turns involved with it. Awesome, awesome, and then, we have here Tanya Norris. Oh, yeah. So, Tanya. 
Tanya, you were in, in red, and uh, also an interior designer for Walt Disney. So, uh, can you tell us, uh, like, how did you get into red? By accident. <laughs> I had arrived in America in 1963. I did my training as an interior decorator in London and had some experience. But I'd made friends with an antique dealer who called me one day. At that point, I'd opened a very small office and was doing some model homes. She said, I've heard of a job for you. I said, oh, forget it. I've got enough gray hairs. She said, no, no, this is with Disney. And it's a 19, uh, 1880s and it's based in New Orleans. She said, it sounds really up your alley. So I said, well, all right. I've heard of Walt Disney. <laughs> <laughs> so that following, I made an appointment for an interview on a Thursday, no, for Wednesday. That Sunday, my husband and I went to Disneyland. We walked down Main Street. We went into uh, one of the areas. We had a hot dog, and I think we walked back down Main Street. And at the interview on Wednesday, I could say, honestly, I had been to Disneyland. <laughs> I was interviewed on the Wednesday, and I didn't think I stood any chance at all of being employed, because there were a great many very sophisticated younger people or young people with great portfolios and, I, and cute little sports cars. And I had four pieces of paper from places around the world that I had been had decorated and that was it. I didn't have any great sketches. So I had a second interview on the Thursday with Emil Curry, Bob Brown and I think uh, John Hench. And then Emil Curry was the interior was head of the uh, decorations at the uh, studio for the films. But he had also had a hand in some of the design for, the, for Disneyland up until that point. I had a call on the Friday and said I had the job. And I remember sitting back in my chair and saying, McKnight, you're an idiot. <laughs> what have you got yourself into? And I started work the following Monday. And for a couple of weeks or so, I finished up my work and went into wed two or three days a week. Bob Brown, who was Walt's son-in-law, husband of Sharon, was my immediate boss, and then John Hench was above that. And Dorothea Redmond, whom I'm sure most of you have heard, absolutely incredible artist. Dorothy and I worked very closely, and I had, before I went to work at WED, I had done architectural renderings, but as soon as I went to WED, and Dorothy and I would be talking and I'd be describing something to her as I'm describing it, it's appearing on the paper. I said, that's the end of my sketches, you know, forget it. <laughs> and I didn't do any other. And so that's how I happened to go to WED. And at that time, I think there were 29 employees. And I then split up into various other groups. We were a little house in the corner of Sonora. And may I go back to something about the Haunting Mansion? In my memory, and I think many of you will agree, that one of the wonderful things about Walt as a genius was his timing for various events to happen so that the public were always kept in suspense. And in my memory, that was the Haunted Mansion. And the various Haunted Mansions were not made because Walt said the time is not right. And that's when the time was right, and he said, go ahead. And that's when we got involved with Auntie Mansion. Now, some of these gentlemen, they were doing it for fun. I was doing it as a job. I got $125 a week. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, but it was a most interesting time to be at WED. I worked with Walt Disney, and I actually traveled to New Orleans with Walt Disney, his wife Lily, his brother Roy and his wife Edna, Bob Brown and his wife Sharon Disney. Uh, Claude was there, Claude Coates, Herb Bryman who was, the, was there, Bill Evans who was the uh, wonderful landscape designer for so much of Disneyland and also uh, Walt Disney World, he was there. And I think one or two others whom I've forgotten, Bill Martin was there. And there is a photograph of myself with Walt in New Orleans, outside, in front of the Gulf Stream, which we were about to board. And uh, as you see, we dressed formally. I, I mean, no, it's true. I never went to work in pants. We had suits, I had pearls, uh, handbag and gloves, and that's how we dressed to go to work. 
uh, I've never, I, I, well, I don't even own a pair now. I don't any, own any jeans, but we were never afraid to going to work in jeans. And we, were, we were very formally dressed. And from New Orleans, we went to Florida. It was a hole in the ground. It's called Project X. And Bill Martin, had, excuse me, Bill Evans, had already brought trees from throughout the world. And they were in Florida hardening off so that when the park was built, they would all be acclimatized to the conditions in Florida. From there, we flew to New York uh, for the World Fair. And let me go to Walt, a couple of stories. Do we have time? Absolutely, go for Thank it. You. Uh, as you see, I was quite young, and only my hairdresser knows how much gray hair I have now. But, uh, in New Orleans, Walt knew I had not, oh, we'll go back to the plane, because I was young, as you can see, or younger, and I was sick on the aircraft. I was so embarrassed, I was so nervous. We tried not to let Walt know, but he found out. So every meal on that trip, when the waiter or waitress would come along and ask for our drink order before lunch or dinner, he would say, she doesn't get a drink. <laughs> that was fine, I didn't really mind that much. The last night, Lily turned to him, and she said, oh, Walt, for goodness sake, let the girl have a drink. And he said, I will not add to the juvenile delinquency of America. She doesn't get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and I never did. I never got a glass of wine. <laughs> but in New Orleans, knowing I had not been there, he insisted we have breakfast in the hotel. And many times, I would go meet him in the uh, suite they had, and he'd be reading the newspaper with his slippers on, and we would talk about what I had done the day before, because I was going to every antique shop in the Vaucaray in the Old Town to buy and search out antiques for New Orleans Square and the shops there and there, and also for the Club 33. And I would report, and I'd show photographs. Sometimes I would bring the items, and we'd discuss it with Bob Brown and uh, uh, Walt. And then we would go for lunch and dinner to a different restaurant so that he would introduce me to the cuisine of New Orleans. In New York, he insisted that the chauffeur drive a different way, different route every day to World Fair so that I would see New York. Now those are some of my memories of Walt Disney. His kindness to me. He used to come in the back door at WED, look at the things on my desk and say, what are you spending my money on today? And I'd show him, he said, I'd show him, he said, I like that, I need Waffy Wander. And uh, I was very fortunate to help uh, go antique shopping with Lily and uh, uh, Diane. I did the interiors, or helped Diane and Ron when they bought the, uh, uh, their ranch out in, in the valley. And uh, then Bob and Sharon, I would help them, and I took Lily and uh, and, uh, excuse me, Edna Antique Shopping, who had a great sense of humor, a sweet lady. And uh, it was a really, a very wonderful time. At the same time, when I see people saying, well, I did this and I did that, and all these names and things, we did it as a team. And our mantra was to have detail and authenticity. Those were what we lived by and researched. So, obviously you have a great history with Walt Disney and, and traveling a lot with him. And uh, you finally had a chance to go back to Disneyland recently and uh, visit the Haunted Mansion. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 50 years since I left, since I was in Disney. And uh, the, the trip to, New, to Disneyland uh, two weeks ago was quite thrilling. But my goodness, how much has changed. And change is a good thing, and change is, hmm. <laughs> uh, I was saddened to see, just because of my fond memories, uh, that some of the things that I did in the Haunted Mansion had totally changed. I remember buying a lot of junk, uh, good things, that went into the attic. There was a children's parameter pram, there was all kinds of antique stuff and lots of cobwebs, and it really looked like an attic totally changed. The wallpaper, the purple wallpaper, now there's some history there that still has to be discovered. 
but I remember doing doodles for, for it. And I remember when I saw it the first time hung in the haunting mansion, kind of pretty, pretty kind of saying, hmm, I did that and nobody knows. <laughs> because nobody did. We didn't put our names on things. The wallpaper's totally changed. If you see the original, it's much more flowing and instead of cutesy little owls, you have kind of abstract bat ghosts, totally different, but still the same color and the same intent. But that's the kind of things that were changed, much has changed, and uh, it, it has two things wear out, everybody has their own idea, but hopefully they have kept authenticity and detail and cleanliness as the three things that Walt wanted in that park. Yeah, absolutely. So, listening to your story, Tanya, and I imagine this goes for many people, especially here on this panel, you know, as years continue to go on and you continue to ride on a haunted mansion, sometimes it might, it, things change a little bit, sometimes maybe it tells you a different story than it did before. Does, do you ever see new things when you go through a haunted mansion? Any one of you? Oh, well, that's simple. Nobody messes with my on the mover. <laughs> everybody here uh, something a lot of people have, didn't appreciate you think normally a project starts goes opens and that's that we go off to do something else that haunted mansion thing was an idea that just kept percolating and percolating all the time there's so many people messing with it and to see all this concrete all this earth moving and everything and then late into the job they adopt my uh, dune buggy and it turns into a demolition zone <laughs> uh, so the change that occurred was before we opened. Think about it. All that work, right? And somebody had a bright idea to do things really, really neat, and uh, the company had no fear to tear up stuff and do it really, really good. It looks like uh, in 1964, maybe when they just when the machine shop finished with their work on uh, the World's Fair. Uh, rather than laying everybody off, you know, some people were, a lot of people were kept with the knowledge that in 65 there was going to be, you know, a lot more things. And it looks like they may have been doing uh, some of the mechanical drawings for some of the things that we see in there today, like the floating candelabra. I found a whole series of uh, drawings, of mechanical drawings for. Uh, oh, that, that's right. The yeah. uh, machine shop uh, in those days, we knew a lot of things we were going to use uh, and other stuff that still had to be developed. Uh, we didn't want to waste any time as long as we had talented people in our, in our maple shop to be able to, to do that. In fact, what's also interesting, everybody asked the question, why did the haunted mansion get built so soon, but there was no attraction, no ride until many years later? Well, we had a, um, a guy that ran the um, Drafting room for the architects over at uh, 800 Sonora, Harvey Gillette, very strong-minded architect. He liked his building after they decided not to make it like a ratty thing, like a, a, one of the Anderson drawings. Somehow Harvey pushed for, we'll finish my drawings and we'll pour the foundation and we'll build my building and then you can continue on later. That's the answer, how that happened. Oh, right. One guy liked his building that much, he pushed until he got it. There we go, that's it, that's it right there. Uh, that's why that thing's been standing there for so long, well before the riot. That's incredible. Uh, and the other thing too I noticed is that I've always felt that the Honda Mansion really is like the best way of storytelling an attraction. I think it's the best way to really reach somebody. But I think it's storytelling, but I think every person has a different story yeah. that they walk away with when they, after they experience it, right? I've always said that I think the best story in Disneyland is Peter Pan. It has one line to the story. Come on, everybody, here we go. And from that point on, it's you flying through the bedroom and out over London, and you flying off to Neverland, and you writing your own story. I think movies, or by their nature, they tell us stories within the movie, but at Disneyland, the best experience is you go home with a story that you created while you wrote it. 
And I think the haunted mansion is one of those rich experiences where, yeah, the guy is talking to you in the doom buggy, but the real story is being written in your mind by what you're picking out of that and seeing it. And to your other question about, you know, the changes, we don't have a filter like Walt Disney that we had one to manage to know what all of us wanted before we knew we wanted it and build it like Steve Jobs did also. And now, some of the things are good. I think the, the Hatbox Ghost, I'm really pr proud of how that came out. Um, there are other things I don't like. I think one of the things we really need to do with technologies that are out there today and the ability we have to convert them into dimensional things is a little bit of stepping up to that line and going in there and touching some of the sacred things. I really think it's time to do that. I'd love to see Madame Leota done today with what I know we could do in that crystal ball. Because when I was a kid, watching a movie projected on a mannequin head was very exciting. But today, you know, it's time to move on to that. And I know we have things that could do that. So I think, hopefully, you'll all be impressed with the things that change. And that's part of life. And I think um, we owe it to the future kids to be just as excited about that. It, the worst thing could be for it to become a museum of things that were really exciting to us back in 1969, and, you know. The theory of it, of going into a place and getting the bejesus scared out of you is still really valid. And so how you do that, though, is so much trickier in, a, in an audience as sophisticated as you are. You could probably go out the door today and buy a lot of the tricks that we have in the haunted mansion yeah. out on that floor. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. There's also a lot of space in there still. Uh, oh, is there's there? a lot of room. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of surface space in there. The, the staircase from the load area, there's opportunities to begin uh, the mood a little bit sooner and to begin the, you know, to offer some things in there. Uh, and there is a lot of physical space. Uh, there's a lot of moments. And I think in opening it, you don't necessarily want to overwhelm or put so much in there, you know, that you can't keep track of it. But this has such a repeat audience that I think, um, you know, it lends itself to adding more and more little surprises here and there every year. And Florida has done that. Um, again, kind of, you know, some things are more successful uh, than other things. But um, I, you know, I think that is the great thing about it. it. It would be to come to it every year. And there's just something, there's something new in it every year uh, that becomes a part of the collection. And then when something becomes old and not really amazing anymore, then it's time to change that out. Done yet? Well, I, I was just going to pile on to the idea of storytelling. There's something that happened, uh, of course, when Disneyland opened, and there were these large kind of experiences like Frontierland or Tomorrowland or whatever. But something about New Orleans Square and the Pirates and the Haunted Mansion uh, became these bigger narratives all of a sudden. And being a kid and even going there now, you just realize the level of storytelling. And I don't know, it, it, it was a, certainly a team effort from a number of people, but you had people like Mark Davis and Dean Tavalaris, who designed a lot of the mansion things, who went on to, to be a production designer for Francis Ford Coppola. And so a lot of people from the film industry who were trained in narrative storytelling and doing art direction and production design for storytelling contributed to that whole area. And there was something about the step up of that early 60s and the work they were doing that was really profound, I think. 1962, uh, someone told me, it might have been um, Buzz Price's son, David, might have been, said, oh yeah, that's the year Buzz said, Walt bit off more than he could chew. Because <laughs> he was starting up the World's Fair, he was um, at Disneyland, it was not only New Orleans Square, it was the Tiki Room, which was first going to be a restaurant, but now it needs really to be its own little attraction. And it was the tree house, and it was reconfiguring part of the Jungle Cruise and tearing out the train tracks on the west side of Disneyland. There were also some other projects that were percolating out there, um, big projects that never happened. But in 1962, I mean, I think that's the most interesting year, not 1959 or 55 even, but 62 when his imagination and his mind and his ambitions were going all over outside of the gates of Disneyland um, to other places. And this New Orleans Square was like, oh, if we're gonna move the train tracks, then we might as well build a basement in there. Put, put a basement in, we'll figure out what to put on 
it'll be New Orleans Square, but we'll figure out the details of that later. And while you're at it, dig the culvert for the haunted mansion called the haunted house at the time. Um, so all that was kind of done, just like get it done. It makes sense. You know, you have the operations people saying, "Yeah, that makes Such sense." Different world this day. <laughs> yeah, and, and you had food people because like, apparently the west side of the park was uh, there was not enough food in Disneyland in general. And then in 1959, when they opened all that stuff and the attendance went up, they were really scarce of food. So Walt was already interested in the idea of underground utilidors and that sort of thing. So we need more food capacity. So put all that stuff down in the ground and then we'll build a New Orleans on top of it. Yeah. There was an interesting thing following up on what Don said. In the movie Cinderella, Walt was criticized because a lot of contemporary animation at that time was going very stylistic and it was very literal and very believable. And uh, Walt came back with and said, if you didn't buy into the worlds I create for Cinderella to live in, then you're not gonna believe in the magic when it comes time in the story for that to happen. And I think a lot of what happens with New Orleans Square and the better things that work at Disneyland, it's so easy for you to buy into the story because it's so well done that you're willing to take a further leap than you might if it was just you know, something you encountered at a carnival or a, a traditional way. So I think that was the leap that Disneyland in general took. And I agree with you, New Orleans took it to the ultimate uh, belief. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Well, I was, New Orleans Square was why I was hired. And the research into that was intense. We went, as you told you, to New Orleans. We bought things there to bring back. Pieces of the iron were replicated. I actually was the one that did all the colors for the original outside, interior, exteriors, and the interiors. We bought a lot of furniture, which went into all of the shops, really. One person I'd like to mention, because I'm sure you've all been to the perfume shop, was a, an artist called Glenda von Kessel, who was an absolutely wonderful lady, and uh, she did all of the reverse paintings, which took, I think, about two years from start to finish. Please do look at that. And think when you go to Disneyland, don't just think it of, of the rides. Okay, we'll go to the Haunted Mansion, we'll go here and there. Please look at the detail. Remember that New York, the going down Main Street, I think it's uh, eighth, eighth uh, scale. It's not full scale, you don't realize that. Look at all the little detailing. That's what, to me, has made Disneyland part of the success today. And that's what Walt wanted. He wanted the detail. He wanted the authenticity. He didn't want you to really uh, it jab it at you, but he wanted it to be as you walk down but please look and realize how much thought and effort. Disneyland's not a place for children, it's a place for people like yourselves that will appreciate what all of us do. What do you guys think about that, huh? That's quite amazing. All right, you guys, well, I had a blast here just celebrating Haunted Mansion. 50 years, can you believe that? It's a 50-year-old ride. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, it just continues on, it continues to thrive, it continues to inspire many people out there, like the ones that are walking out the door right this is <laughs> It's like absolute inspiration. Yeah, they're going to Disneyland right now. <laughs> no, but thank you guys so much for being here today. I cannot believe Thank you so much. Once again, all the way at the end, Bob Gerd, this is my good. Bill Fisher, Don Todd. Disney legend, Tony Baxter. Former Imagineer, Tom Morris. And from Wed and Interior, she's on her Kanye Norris. I'm Doug Barnes. She's a past podcast. Thank you guys so much for being here. We had a blast. Let's go, Midsummer Squaring!